In Vancouver, Washington, on January 7, 2007, 25-year-old Dylan Ray Peterson called 911 after he murdered his friend's brother and mother. Dylan was a student at Western Culinary Institute in Portland, Oregon, which is where he met Nick Nagel. Peterson then lost his Portland apartment, and Nagel allowed him to stay at a duplex he lived in, alongside his brother Matthew and his father Eric. Matthew and Nick's mother, 44-year-old Sandra Terrell, was divorced from her husband, so she lived elsewhere. Dylan lived with the family for two months. On January 6th, Nick and his father went away for the night, and Sandra went to the duplex to spend time with Matthew and Dylan. The next morning, at around 7am, Dylan made his 911 call. Sunday, 1, 7, 2007, at 0, 7, 0, 3. 911, how may I help you? Um, I'm Dylan Peterson, and I just killed two people. Who did you kill? Uh, Matthew Nagel and, uh... And, uh, mm, Mrs. Nagel, I guess. Okay, and where are you at right now? I am at, uh, 21, no, 2901 North K Street. And how did you kill them? Vancouver, with a knife. Are they there too? Um, not anymore. Where are they at? Uh, well, they're, they're here physically, but they're not here, uh, yeah, spiritually. Their their bodies are there. Yeah. Who are they to you? Who are they to me? Uh huh. No one. What's your name? My name's Dylan Peterson. Peterson. What's yeah. your first name? Joan. No, Dylan Peterson. Joan. D O A N. What? How do you spell your first name? How I spell it for Dylan. Dylan. Yeah. And what's your middle initial, Dylan? R. And your date of birth? Come on, I just killed two people. What's your date of birth, Dylan? Come on. Dylan, how old are you? Uh, just, uh, the lights on. Get them here. Okay, where are you at in the house? At the front door. Where's the knife at? Where's the knife at? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay, Dylan, tell me where the knife is at. You know where it's at. No. The knife? I'll look for it. No, I don't want you to get it. I want you to tell me where it's at in the house. Um, I... <laughs> um... <laughs> no. I okay, killed well, two people. It's awful. Why did you kill them? Why? Uh-huh. <sighs> why? Oh. Do you live there? No. Okay. How did you get into their house? They let me in. Okay. Really? No. Come on. I killed two people. I, under, I understand that, John. You got that? Yes. I killed two people. I okay. killed them. Why did you kill them? Why? Yes. Because. Because why? Because I was born to. Oh. Vancouver K Street. There's an orange Camaro outside. There's a red neon, you know, somewhere near. Is the Camaro yours? No. 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 Okay. You've got to be kidding me. Okay. What type of I car do you have? I easy. I would have done it sooner. Do you realize that? What type of car do you have, Where's Dylan? There's a knife. I don't drive. Come okay. on. Give me a break. Where do you live at? Oh, awful. Awful. It's terrible. I call 911, and there's no cops here. Okay, we're... I, I, I gave you the street, the cross street, I gave you everything. And and there are two people dead, and it's bloody, and it's gross. Okay, how long ago did you do this? 
After I knew both of them were dead? No. How long ago did that happen? Are you sure that they're How dead? How long ago? Yes. <laughs> oh, poor Sandy just stopped breathing. Poor Sandy just stopped breathing. Okay. Poor Sandy. Poor Is Sandy. anybody else there with you? No. No, there's not. But there's a ton of blood. Oh, okay. Are you still by the front door? Um, no, but the front door is open. The front door is open? Yeah. The okay. dog's outside. Where are you at in the house? By the front door. It's not a big apartment. Okay. It's not a big apartment. Stay outside with blood all over myself. Are you inside or outside right now? I'm outside. I'm uh, I'm in the doorway, talking to you, okay. looking at the trellis that is uh that is toppled over. Yeah. No. I killed two people with a knife. Okay. I killed two people with a knife. Do you know what that takes? It takes a lot. Awful. It's terrible. It's awful. Okay, do you know where the knife is right now? Where? No. Do you have it on you? No. Okay. No. I killed him and I lost it. You think I'm shitting you? You really think I'm shitting you? No, I uh, believe you, Dylan. I believe you. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No. Dad, it's terrible. Terrible. I killed okay. them. Do you know those people, or you just picked that house? And we see five standing there on up 40. Copy. PD's just arriving. I'll update you when I can. Everything comes to an end, right? Everything. I killed two fucking people. I killed them. I can't believe I killed them, but I did. I killed them. I killed them both. It was me. Yeah, there's blood everywhere. There was a fight. It was terrible. What there happened? Was, they let you in and you uh, had a fight with them? There are, there are lifeless bodies here. Did you go there with mm. the intention to kill them, Dylan? Oh. Hmm. What the intention? Oh, I think they're here. I think the cops are here. They want you to stay on the phone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, the cops are here. Doug's barking and the cops are here. Okay. Yeah, they're here. All right. Okay, stay on the phone until I tell you no, it's okay fine. to hang up, okay? The cops are here. They're here. Yeah, no. Man. Ah. Are you still in the doorway? No. Where are you at now? Cops. I'm waiting for the cops. I know you're waiting for the cops. I know I'm waiting for the cops. Are you inside or outside? Oh. <sighs> Shit. It was me. It was all me. The massacre. Disgusting. No, Dylan, stop. That's what they said. No, Dylan, stop. No. No. I saw the knife. I saw the knife months ago. I saw the knife. Oh. Yeah. Mm. My goodness. There's a talented boy. Right here. And a sick mother. Oh. There were a ton of people here. There were a ton of people here. When this happened, there were a ton of people there? No. Oh, okay. No. No, there wasn't. <sighs> Come on. This is not a joke. 
This is not a joke. I'm talking to you. I'm staying on the phone. Yeah, I understand it's not a joke. Yeah. There's nobody here. Yeah. No. Is that your yeah. dog that's there? They're here. Yeah, that's that's the dog. Is it your dog? Do you know what its name is? Uh, it's Daisy. Daisy? Mm-hmm. What type Daisy. of dog is it? Daisy. It's a, it's a black lab. Okay. Where is it at right now? Is it outside or inside? Oh, they're here. All right. Okay. I'm Make sure your hands are visible. I will. If they call you out, okay? Okay. Okay, make sure your hands are All up right. and visible. You don't... I have a bloody hand. Okay, make sure they're up and visible. Okay, go ahead and go out, Dylan. When police arrived, they discovered the dead bodies of Sandra and Matthew. Sandra had been stabbed and Matthew's neck was slashed. Dylan had a blood alcohol level of 0.19 and 0.21 and also had a history of depression, which resulted in six suicide attempts. After undergoing mental evaluations, he was found competent enough to stand trial. On April 30th, 2007, Dylan Peterson was found guilty of two counts of first-degree murder 
and was sentenced to 57 years in prison. During the trial, Peterson gave no reasons as to why he killed the mother and son, leaving heartbroken family members with unanswered questions. Dylan will be released from prison in 2064. At that point, he'll be 83 years old. On July 22nd, 2015, a 911 call was made by 12-year-old Daniel Bever from the Bever residence in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, after two family members started killing everybody in the home. The Bever residence was home to Daniel, his 52-year-old father David, 42-year-old mother April, 18-year-old Robert, 16-year-old Michael, 13-year-old Crystal, 7-year-old Christopher, 5-year-old Victoria, and 2-year-old Awesome. Daniel was hiding in the home office when he made a 911 call. Okay, 911. Broken Air 911. Hello? Hello? Hi, where are you at? They open out Oklahoma 7411. What address? 709 Magnolia Court. Seven, okay, are you the only one there? No, my brother's attacking my family. Your dad is attacking your family? No, my brother. Hello? He has a nine days deal with me. Oh, tens of millions of people now. Okay, who's attacking your family? What? Who's attacking your family? Yes. Who, who is it? Do they yeah, have are you there? Hello? Hi, what's going on there? What's going on there? Hello? Hello? The massacre started when Roberts and Michael called Crystal into their room and asked her to view something on the computer. Their plan was to kill Crystal quickly and hide her body in the closet before taking out the rest of the family. When her back was turned, they slit her throat, but she fought back. So Robert continued to stab her. She ran from the bedroom screaming and made it out the front door, but the boys caught up to her and stabbed her some more. Roberts and Michael then brutally stabbed their mother April to death. April owned a Reddit account called Aoki Mom and was very active on there. In one of her posts, a commenter mentions how it's nice that her kids get along enough not to fight. The other children in the house realized what was happening and tried to hide. Christopher and Victoria locked themselves in the bathroom and hid in there. Michael went to the door and asked them to open up, saying that it was Robert that was doing the killing. One of them opened the door, and Michael stabbed them both to death. Daniel hid in the home office, and Michael used the excuse that Robert was trying to kill him in order to get him to let him in. Once Daniel opened the door, he saw both brothers standing there. Michael told Robert that Daniel was all his. Robert then stabbed him to death. The father, David, then came out of the bedroom and was stabbed to death by Robert. The brothers said that they planned to decapitate two-year-old Awesome, but they forgot all about her during the crime spree. 
The brothers also admitted that they were going to travel to other cities and go on shooting sprees, using ammunition that was due to be delivered to the house the day after the familicide. Police arrived to the home and found the bodies of the Bever family. Two-year-old Awesome and Crystal were the only survivors. Daniel had died a hero and managed to save his sister, and many other lives in the process. The brothers were both convicted and received several life sentences, and it is expected that they will die in prison. On July 4th, 2011, a man came home from work and discovered the lifeless body of his fiancée, 59-year-old Carol Ann Johnson, on the kitchen floor of their home, located on the 300 block of Pine Valley Drive. She had been stabbed numerous times with a knife. The call was made at 3 a.m.
you she gave me a kiss and and I got in my vehicle and and drove off. <laughs> okay. I do have them coming out there. I have EMS and the fire department coming out there. She had both both outside lights on, and that's unusual for her to have. That. I don't I don't know what in the world. Okay. Okay, I have them coming out there to you. Okay, they had both the lights on. You said, and they don't usually do that. Yeah, I, I cut the lights off when I when I get when I went through the door. I I noticed it was unlocked, but you know I thought maybe she had gone to sleep and forgot about it. Okay. And so I cut the outside lights off, and I went into the kitchen and I saw her there. Okay. Are you outside? Are you outside right now? Yes, I'm in I'm in the driveway. Okay. As Please tell them to hurry. I don't know if they can do anything for it. It's cold as ice. Okay. They're, they're on their way. I got the I got fire department, law enforcement, and EMS. So I'm not going to get off the phone with you, okay? You're staying on the phone with me. <laughs> okay. Who would do this to Jesus? <laughs> Okay. All right. Did you touch her at all? Yeah, like I, I touched her with 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 the back of my hand, just okay. the feel of her, and I she like she's cold. Okay. Do you think you're safe where you're at right now? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. If if, okay. if whoever it is, if they. I mean, I don't know if I don't know if she fell, but there's blood. There, there's a towel around her, 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 her ankles and everything, and there's blood there, and there's blood where at her head. And I know she was going to stay up until 12 because she always rings this her her grandmother's bell at 12:01 for the 4th of July. So I know she would have stayed up till then. Okay. They're, they're coming. Okay. All right, go ahead and stay on the phone to me until they get there, though, okay? It's here, the EMS team's here. All right. Johnson's neighbors described her as a kind woman who had lived alone on Pine Valley Drive for 15 years. She had been engaged to marry her boyfriend of two years, Christopher Munn, who had just moved in. Johnson had been stabbed nine times with wounds to the neck, back and chest, and it's believed the wound to her neck or chest was the fatal one. As of January 2021, no arrests have been made and this murder has remained unsolved for the last nine years. The FBI has been involved with the ongoing investigation, but not much information has been made available to the public. On June 19, 2017, Fosis Julos called 911 after not being able to contact his wife. His wife's name was Jennifer Julos, and Fosas claimed that he didn't know where she or their five children were. He made a call at 9.30 p.m. from Farmington, Connecticut. Farmington 911, what's the location of your emergency? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm worried about my uh, wife and kids because they, uh, they left to go to New York and I haven't uh, been able to get in touch with them. Okay, where, they were going to New York, what's the license plate on the car? Excuse me? What's the license plate on the car? Uh, I have to get them for you. Okay, what's, what's the, who's the car registered to? It's uh, registered to my wife's name, Jennifer Dulos. Spell the last name for me. 
Uh, Dulos, D U L O S. Jennifer, G A E N N I F E R. Yes. Your hair or date of birth? Uh, it's uh, September 27, 1968. And then um, they were joining with a uh, with baby team. Can you help out as well? Okay, what That's kind of, hold on, hold on. What kind of car were they driving? It was a Range Rover. Was a Range Rover? Yep. Hold on, let's see. Uh, black, 2016 black Land Rover Range Rover? Yes. Yep. Okay, when were they supposed to be there? Um, they were supposed to be there. Hello? Can you give me the address as well as the apartment? Okay. But none, uh, the room call is not answering. Uh, they're not answering their cell phones. Okay, what's their cell phone and, number? Uh, it's uh, 860 mm -hmm. 604. 604? No, 604, yep. Okay. Okay, you keep breaking up, sir. I need you to hold the phone to your face because I keep hearing you really far away. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm just nervous. Uh, 860. 604. 604-9406. That's my wife's cell phone number. Okay, and who's the other person that's with your wife? And uh, that is the babysitter. Uh, her name is Lauren. Lauren? Lauren. Do you know her last name? Yes, uh, Almeida. A L M E I D A. Okay, and her cell phone number? Uh, let me give it to you one second. And who else is with them? Uh, that's it. Okay, no kids. And did you, you say there were kids with them or not? Uh, they're the, my first kids, yes. Yeah. How many kids? Two? Uh, five. Five kids? Yep. Okay. Let me give you her number. 860? Mm-hmm. 190-9555? Mm-hmm. 990-9555? 190-9555 or 490-9555? Okay, 860-490-9555. Okay, and how, uh, how long ago did they leave Connecticut? Thankfully, Jennifer and the children were safe and sound. The next day, she filed for divorce in the Superior Court in Stamford, Connecticut. Two years later, a mysterious fate would befall on Jennifer. Jennifer Dulos was born in 1968 in New York City. Her future husband, Phosos, was born on August 6, 1967 in Turkey and grew up in Greece before moving to the US when he was 19. Fotis started emailing Jennifer while still with his first wife. They married in Manhattan just a month after Fosus' divorce from his first wife on August 28, 2004, and moved to Farmington, Connecticut. 
They had five children together, including two sets of twins. They are all named after Greek Orthodox saints. They had three sons, Petros, Theodore and Constantine, and two daughters, Christiane and Cleopatra Noel. Despite Jennifer requesting an emergency order of custody, the couple were given temporary joint custody of their children until the end of the divorce proceedings. When Jennifer again requested an emergency order of custody in early 2018, the judge found that Phosis had broken numerous court orders. So Jennifer was awarded sole custody of the children, while both parents were to share joint legal custody. Phosis was granted supervised visitation and monitored phone calls. In February 2018, after Jennifer's father's death, Gloria Farber, Jennifer's mum, sued Phosis for unpaid loans. She claimed that he owed them $1.7 million loaned to him by his father-in-law. On May 24, 2019, Jennifer dropped her children off at New Cannon Country School at 8 a.m. At 8.05 a.m., a neighbor's security camera captured her returning home. The same day, she missed two doctor's appointments that she had scheduled for 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. in New York City. Later that evening at around 7 p.m., two of her friends, including her nanny, Lauren Almeida, reported her missing after they failed to get in contact with her. Family and friends stated it would be out of character for her to leave home on her own without telling anybody. Lauren had arrived at the house earlier that day and told detectives that she was surprised to see Jennifer's Range Rover in the garage because she had planned to take it to her doctor's appointment instead of her Chevrolet Suburban, which was missing. When detectives searched the house, they found blood splatter on the floor, door, and a wall in the garage, as well as on the exterior of the Range Rover. Blood was also found in the kitchen. DNA tests revealed most of it to be Jennifer's, apart from blood on the kitchen faucet, which belonged to her husband, Phyllis. Jennifer's Chevrolet Suburban had been captured on the security camera, leaving her home at around 10.25am that morning. It's believed that Phosis was driving it with Jennifer's body inside. Now prior to all of this, Phosis was rumored to be having an affair with Michelle Traconis, who was a native of Venezuela. At 7pm on the day that Jennifer disappeared, Phosis and Michelle were captured on video dumping garbage bags into 30 bins in Hartford. They were later found to contain various pieces of bloody clothing as well as blood-stained cleaning items. The blood was determined to be Jennifer's. Phoas's DNA was found on the inside of a glove in one of the trash bags. Jennifer's Suburban was later found on the side of a road near Waveni Park in New Cannon, just over three miles away from her home. On June 1st, 2019, both Phoas and Michelle were arrested, and the five children, then aged between 8 and 13, moved to New York City to live with Jennifer's mother to whom a judge granted temporary custody. Fotis and Michelle both pleaded not guilty to the charges. They were arrested yet again for tampering with evidence and again pleaded not guilty in September of 2019. Fotis appeared in court on October the 4th to seek a dismissal of the charges against him. The judge said he would review the arguments by the defense and prosecution. On January 7th, 2020, Despite Jennifer's body not being found, Phyllis was finally charged with her murder. After Jennifer disappeared, a shallow grave was discovered at a secluded property that belonged to Phyllis's friend and former attorney, Kent Douglas Mahini, filled with two bags of lime and a blue tarp. Authorities and a sniffer dog discovered the grave in August of 2019, but no body was found inside, and the said items were found to have been removed. On January 8th, Fotos' bond was set at $6 million. He was released the following day and was due to return to court on February 28th. On January 28th, he missed an emergency bond meeting, so police were sent to check on him. They found him in an unresponsive state by police. They found him in an unresponsive state in his home, having poisoned himself with carbon monoxide by running a vacuum cleaner hose from the exhaust pipe of his SUV into the interior of the car while it was parked in his garage. It was initially reported that Phoas was dead, 
but responders had performed CPR and restored a faint pulse. After arriving at Yukon Medical Center, he was airlifted to Jacoby Medical Center to undergo hyperbaric oxygen therapy in the Bronx. Phyllis's five children visited him at the medical center before he was taken off life support. This was the first time they had seen their father since he was accused of murdering their mother. Phyllis was officially pronounced dead on January 30th, 2020. He was 52. He left a suicide note in his car that read, I refuse to spend even an hour more in jail for something I had nothing to do with. In May of 2021, a domestic violence bill called Jennifer's Law received near unanimous support in the Connecticut State Senate. The proposed law is named after two victims of domestic violence in Connecticut, both named Jennifer. As well as Jennifer Julos, Jennifer Magnano was murdered by her husband, Scott Magnano, in Terryville, Connecticut in 2007. Scott Magnano committed suicide immediately after murdering his wife in front of their three children. On June 28, 2021, Governor Ned Lamont signed the bill into law. To this day, Jennifer Julos' body has never been found. On April 14, 2011, an employee at Sharps Outdoor Power Equipment in Seattle, Washington, called 911 after he shot an intruder that was trying to break into the business. The employee was sleeping inside the store after it had been broken into six times in the past, when at around 11.20pm he heard glass breaking. He grabbed the revolver and went to investigate. It was then that he saw two men, James Stapleton and Andrew Sidden, breaking in. Both of them had previous murder and assault charges. The unidentified employee then opened fire on Stapleton, who was the first intruder he noticed. He shot only one bullet and Stapleton was hit. The employee then noticed Sidden and told him not to move. He then called 911. Hello, one when you're reporting. Uh, yes, I got. I just shot someone in my business. Um, I'm at 5931 Fourth Avenue South, Seattle, Washington, at Sharps Outdoor Power. Okay, and who did you shoot? I don't know. Uh, there's another one. I got him. I got a gun on him. Was he somebody got, trying to break in? They broke in the door and was st- uh, taking the stuff out the door. Okay. Hang on a minute. Radio. Uh, radio. This is. Um, Shoplifters that came inside the business. Do not move. The owner has them at gunpoint. He did shoot one. He shot. A, he shot a, a, okay. a shoplifter. All right. What, one is down. One is being held at gunpoint. Okay. What's the store there? It's a Sharp Outdoor. Oh, you're. I'm sorry. Go ahead. A sharp Shop Inc. Sharp Outdoor Power. Sharp Outdoor Power. Which yeah, street it's, address? It's in 5931. Fourth Avenue South. We're in the Old Buckner, Weatherby, or Seattle Auction House. Okay, 59314 Avenue South? Yes, there's okay. a truck in the driveway. Pull right up in front of the truck. They've broken the door, and I'll keep the guy at gunpoint. I'm standing here in my underwear. All right, so is the other guy bleeding? Uh, he's not moving. Yes, he's bleeding. No, bleeding. Yes. He is, okay. Do I put this as a weapons call radio? Uh, no, make it a burglary one. Okay. God. All right, I'm going to get the medics on the line, sir, and we're going to get somebody there for you. All right, this other guy's begging to look. I, I'm not letting him move. Okay. All right. Hang on. Don't hang up yet. All right. All right, and let me get the medics on the line real quick. Hang on. Seattle Fire Medic 1, what is the address? Uh, fire, this is at 59314 Avenue South. Uh, owner of the business uh, shot a shoplifter, has another at gunpoint. If you could stand by, we've got police on the way there. It's the out shop outdoor power. Okay. And the owner is inside. Okay, we'll be there in a couple minutes. Thank you. And sir, what is your last name? My last Your first name? And what's your phone number there? Okay. What's the name of this business again? Sharps, Sharps Outdoor Power. Sharps Outdoor Power. Yeah, we're right on the south side of Fodalgo. All right, you in a big warehouse? Yes, it's in uh, a big building. There's a sign out front. Okay. 
So they broke in your front yes, door? Yes, they busted in the front door. All right. And I come out, well, I'll explain to you whatever you Okay, what there. kind of gun do you have? A three fifty seven Magnum. All right, revolver? Yes. Okay. Lay down. Lay down. Uh, we do have police in the area, and they should be there any minute. If you don't mind staying on the phone with me, no, I, I like you're doing a great job here. We're we're almost there. I've never shot nobody before. I know. Well, they could have easily gone the other way. So I thought it was. I told him not to move. Yep, I understand. Well, we've got police in the area, and they should be getting there any minute. So, All right. um, in case this guy runs, or in case something He's else, not going to run. I got him on the floor. Okay. I'm just saying, I want you to stay on the phone until we get yes, the place there, just so to make sure in case he runs out or something happens. So, so if we if we go to your front door, which it's side? broken. Yeah, you can see it yeah, on the side, side of the building, the, the north side of the on building. North side. Okay. There's a white truck parked right in the driveway by the door. All right. Of the police are pulling up now. Okay. As soon as you see them there and they see you, you can hang up the phone with me. Okay. I'll wait till I see them. Yeah. Do you own that white truck? Uh, no. That's the robbers that, do. Oh, that's theirs. Okay. Yes. All right. I gotta call my boss. Well, let's get this result first. Yeah. All right. So, do you know what kind of a truck that is? I do not. It looks like it might be a Bronco or something. Okay. But it's a pickup. The police are right in front of it. Yeah. Okay. I gotta get some clothes on. Okay, the officers are probably going to be coming in the door. Yeah, that's can, fine. Can you put that revolver, like, I, in a down. pocket or something? Or it's a holster? down. All right. There's a dog with them. Yeah. Come on in! I want me to hang up. No, not yet. The gun is down! I'm, and then as soon as the officers come in and they see you, uh -huh. and they're talking to you, then there's you a woman out there too. Okay. Yeah, there's a female officer there. I didn't know what else to do. You know what? It, like I said, it could have easily gone the other way. And you don't know if they, you know? I mean, yeah, I mean, I told him not to move, and he started reaching into his pocket for something, well, throwing one of the things down, and I didn't know what else to do. Yeah, I understand. My God. So do they have those two in handcuffs now? Uh, they got one of them outside. The other one's one not them. moving. I don't think he's even breathing. Okay. I think I've killed somebody. I can need to step out. Are they asking you to come out? Yes, they're asking me to come out. Okay. Stapleton died and Sidden was arrested. The employee wasn't charged, as it was ruled self-defense. It's not known what Midden was charged with, although he did face a 17 to 22 month prison sentence if convicted. On December 5th, 2019, in Miramar, Florida, multiple 911 calls came in after a UPS truck was hijacked and the highway shootout began. 
The incident took place during rush hour traffic, and innocent bystanders had to dodge bullets being fired between police and the hijackers. Some people called from the scene and others made their calls after they arrived home and found that their vehicle was riddled with bullet holes. I didn't hear them, I didn't see them. I'm inside of a business and my co-workers are running. So I locked my suite and I'm in the dark. But I was able to have my phone in my hand. While they were shooting, his vehicle was right in front of the UPS um, truck while they were shooting and the bullets hit his car. And ma'am, is he injured in any way? He is not injured. When the bullet came through the car, he laid backwards so that he didn't get hit. Okay, and you said there's multiple bullet wounds? It's multiple. Uh, uh, bullet holes in his car? Yes. yes. One, two, three, four, five, it's about five, six shots. Wow, that was crazy, man. And is anyone injured? Are you injured? No, thank God. The bullet crossed all the way through my daughter's car seat, but she wasn't here, thank God. All right, so regarding while the police chase was happening, um, long story short, my car was the car that ended up right next to the UPS driver. So shots started getting fired, and I was able to wiggle my way out of that situation. But now, hours later, I'm at home, and I just discovered that I think I have bullet wounds, bullet shot holes um, on my car. The two hijackers were Ronnie Jerome Hill and Lamar Alexander, both of whom were aged 41. The rampage began at 4.15pm when they robbed a store called Regent Jewelers in Coral Gables. One of the robbers fired his weapon into the ground which ricocheted and struck a worker, injuring her. The manager chased them away and the two robbers tried to get away in a U-Haul. They then abandoned the U-Haul and hijacked the UPS truck and took the driver hostage. A chase began with police, but the truck was able to drive 25 miles away while maneuvering around traffic. An hour after the initial robbery, the chase ended at a busy intersection, and the truck became trapped by rush hour traffic. Over 40 police officers and vehicles had become involved. As they were trying to take down the hijackers, they had to use surrounding cars as human shields, endangering the lives of the passengers inside of them. One caller to 911 said a bullet went through his daughter's car seat, which was unoccupied, thankfully. Nineteen officers were firing at the truck, and it's unclear who began firing first. The shootout resulted in the deaths of four people, including the shooters and the driver of the UPS truck, 27-year-old Frank Ordonez. 70-year-old Richard Cutshaw was also killed, and it's not clear whose bullets killed Frank and Richard. Frank had been substituting for the usual driver, and it was his first time driving the UPS truck alone. He was the father of two daughters aged 3 and 5. He was described as an outgoing and happy person. Richard Cutshaw had been driving home from the job he loved and was caught in the crossfire during the shooting. He was set to retire in a couple of years. Many people, especially the families of the two victims, questioned why the police would shoot lots of bullets at the UPS truck, knowing that the driver was inside and putting the lives of innocent drivers at risk during the rush hour traffic. On September 14, 2020, a lawsuit was filed by the family and estates of Frank Ordonez against six police agencies, the Miami-Dade Police Department, the Broward County Sheriff's Office, the Florida Highway Patrol, and the Miramar, Doral, and Pembroke Pines Police Departments. The lawsuit was also filed on behalf of another man, Carlos Lara, who was seriously hurt in the chase and shootout that ended on the Miramar Parkway. The suit alleges that Carlos was seriously hurt when bullets hit his car as police used his vehicle as a shield during the gunfight. 
Frank's family also wants to see police body cam footage of the shoes out so they can see who killed their beloved family member. In Wheeling, Illinois, on October 28, 1991, a strange and mysterious 911 call was made by a man who told police to go to 1765 Stonehenge Court to check up on a woman who wasn't breathing. When the operator asked him what he was doing in the house, he hung up. Police traced the call to a payphone outside of a liquor store in a strip mall a half block from the house. 27 year old Jamie Lynn Santos was found inside. She had been smothered to death with a pillow, and there was evidence of a struggle but not of any sexual assault. She was an erotic dancer in Wheeling and lived just down the road from her parents. As her job, Jamie would dance for private parties in Wheeling and Chicago. When her parents first learned about her work, they were concerned for her safety. However, their fears were put to ease when they learned that she would have a driver with her at all times, protecting her from any potentially dangerous customers. She also said that she would leave a party any time she felt that something wasn't right about the situation. The night before her murder, Jamie felt ill, so she cancelled several appointments for the next day. She rented some videotapes and spoke to a friend. That friend? was the last person to ever speak to Jamie Lynn Santos. The 911 call was made at 11.30am the next morning. It's unknown if the man who called was the murderer or if he was just passing by. Shortly after the murder, investigators reviewed surveillance video from the liquor store where the call was placed. The video showed a man making a purchase in the store around the time the 911 call was made. However, after the video was shown to the public, He was identified and determined not to be the caller. He was also cleared of any involvement in Jamie's death. To this day, the actual caller has never been identified. Police believe that Jamie's killer may have been someone she met while working as an exotic dancer. According to her family and friends, she made a rule that she would not date any customers. Investigators believe that her killer may have been one of her customers that would not take no for an answer or even one of her drivers that might have had a secret obsession for her. They theorized that he may have gone to her house that day to have sex with her. When she refused, he mortally wounded her. After realizing he hurt her, he may have felt remorse and decided to call the police. This case was covered on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries on January 10th, 1997, and Wheeling Police received at least 20 calls as a result of the broadcast. It's not known if any information was uncovered as a result of these calls. In 2011, investigators submitted Jamie's clothing and other evidence from the crime scene to a forensics lab, hoping to find DNA or other evidence belonging to the killer. As of November 2021, nothing has come of this, and Jamie Lynn Santos' murder remains unsolved. On March 2nd, 2014, a man named Robert Early, who resided in Carlsbad, New Mexico, called 911 
and stated that he was concerned because his girlfriend had not returned to her motel. What is your emergency? Yes, um, my girlfriend went left last night. Uh, we were at the Stevens Bar and I'm staying in the hotel there, and she hasn't made it back to the hotel. She, I don't know where she went. She left with, she was talking about leaving with some other guy, and she hasn't made it back. Okay, and where are you at? The Stevens Inn. What room? Uh, 402. What is your name? It's Robert Early. How do you spell your last name? B-A-R-L-E-Y. And your phone number is 817-308-7251? Yes, yes ma'am. And where do you live, Robert? Uh, in, in uh, U.S., Texas. And okay. she has some insecurities and look okay, what is her name? Emily Lambert. I just, I didn't know maybe she got picked up for a PI. Maybe she walked down the road. She was she's in a, a really cute dress and some high heels and I had her ID and her phone was in the room on the charger. We took my phone and I really didn't think anything of it because she was like she was like, well, this guy over here has been hitting on me, and he says, you aren't going to treat me right. Um, then he'll take me home. And I was like, whatever, if that's what you really want. Okay, what kind, what color dress? Um, it was like white and black. With black high heels, with, with little bitty silver balls, I think, on the bottom of the heel. And her purse is in the car, but she don't have anything with her. I've driven up and down the street to look to see if she was walking down the road or something. Uh -huh. and I, I haven't seen her. And I've called, I mean, I've talked to her parents, to her ex-husband. No, nobody's heard from her. Okay. Is her phone in the room or her purse is yeah, in the car? Yeah, her phone, her phone is here. She didn't. She, she was wearing a. She was wearing a. She didn't have any pockets. Okay. Let me go ahead and have an, an officer come see you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh huh. Robert Early, age 34, later admitted to killing his girlfriend, 30-year-old Emily Lambert who was originally from Garland, Texas, and was the mother of two daughters aged five and four from a previous relationship. She had traveled to Carlsbad to be with Robert and they went to a bar together, but he became infuriated when another man began flirting with her. The couple got into a fight in his home and she bit him before he kicked her in the mouth multiple times and punched her until she became unconscious. He then loaded her into his car and hit the road. Somewhere along the way, she woke up and he attacked her with an air pump. Once they had gotten to a desolate location, he then tied a rope around her neck and dragged her behind the car. He eventually left her unconscious behind the metal sheets, only to return the next morning to find that she was dead. Her body was found naked except for a bra, and Early, who was an oil rig worker, was charged with murder, tampering with evidence, and being a fugitive from justice. On May 15, 2015, Robert was sentenced to spend the rest of his life in prison. He asked for forgiveness from Emily's family, but said he didn't expect it, saying that he would change places with her if he could. On May 19, 2018, in North Bend, Washington, 31-year-old Isaac Cedarbaum called 911 after he and his friend were attacked by a cougar while mountain biking in the Snoqualmie woods. 
he and 32 year old SJ Brooks were spotted by the cougar and despite making loud noises to try and scare us away, the cougar charged at them. Isaac tried calling 911 immediately after, but he couldn't get a signal so he cycled a few miles down the trail and called again, this time being connected to 911. Even though he was severely injured, Isaac told the dispatcher that he was extremely worried about his friend, who had been dragged away by the cougar. 911, what are you reporting? Help, oh, I got attacked by a mountain lion. My, me and my friend. I'm not where are you? I where I am. Where are you? Oh, I'm, I'm near an outside. I, I was following. I went north out of north end on a trail up in the logging okay. road. Stay on the line for the fire department. Hang on just a moment, please. Where? Listen, listen to me. Like, where, where are you? Nine one one. Now okay. emergency. King County with a transfer. He says him and his friend were attacked by a mountain lion. I'm trying to figure out where they're at, sir. Sir. I'm on some. Lo I'm on a logging road north of North End. Okay. Were you on like a trail or something? Yeah. Okay. Um, Hold on, I hear a car. I hear a car. Like lagging down. Hello? Are you along a roadway? Yeah, I see a car. Okay, do you, you know what car? roadway it is? No, I don't. Hold on, I'll ask the car to talk to you. Yep, flag him down. I did, I did. Okay. Hold on. Can you talk to 911? I got attacked by a mountain lion. My friend is up there. I don't know. Hello. 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 Hi there. Yes. Hi there. Do you know what road you're on? Yeah, we are on the north, um, the north fork of uh, Snoqualmie. Oh, okay. Give me one moment here. Um, like, does the road have a name? <laughs> yeah, it's um, you go up Green Grove. No north end at all. Up uh, southeast Bernie's Road. Mm -hmm. No, no. Do you know North End at all? North Sorry, so Ernie's Rockies. Grove Road. Yeah. Okay. Gotta get somebody out here. Um, okay. I'm trying to find it on my map. Okay. <sighs> okay. So you head out Ballarat Road out of North End. And then you take that out the north fork, middle, the north fork of the Snoqualmie Road. You're not gonna die. Okay. Yeah. Ma'am, you're you're with that one man. And then, do we have any idea how far his friend is away from him? No, we just we just we just came across him yep. on the road. Nope. I I get it. Yep. So can you send someone out with the Yes, ma'am. We're, we're already just, yeah, ma'am, help's already been sent. We're just trying to tell them how to get there the quickest way. Yeah, so, okay. um, yeah, if you take so the road. It says 57 on my map. Okay, um, so the, the cell phone hit was on North, North Fork Road Southeast. Is that the road that you're on? Can you put the, the, the guy back on the phone for me? Ma'am? 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 Mm -hmm. Can you put the guy back on the phone for me? I don't think they're on the phone with us anymore, Fire. Okay, I'm going to try to give him a call back here. Okay, I'll go ahead and drop off. Thank you. All right, thank you. Hello? Hey, is this Isaac? Yeah, this is Paul, this is Paul actually. I'm here with Isaac. Okay, yeah. perfect. Can you put Isaac back on? Yes. Thank you. Hear me? Yeah, sorry about that. Looks like the line dropped off there. So what's going on? How are you doing? I need an ambulance. Yeah, we've already notified them. We're just trying to get to your location. You're kind of out in the woods there, so we're trying to make sure that we're setting him to the right place. We think we got a good location for you, but we want to make I'm sure that you're doing okay. 
I'm so worried about my son. Okay. Do you know where, how far out he is from where you are? At most five miles. Okay. But he's behind the gate. He's behind the gate. Do you know, like, if it was like a trailhead that you started at, or it's it's on logging road. Okay, so you're out on a logging road. Yeah. Okay. If you go to, are you are you connected to the internet? Yeah. If you go to ride with GPS.com. Oh, I'm second here. Very good hurt. I know. I know, but you're doing a really great job staying calm there. We're trying to, you know, give you all the help that you need there. Um, and just, uh, I think I told you, the people who are with you, I want to make sure that you're keeping pressure on your wounds to try to control the bleeding. They said it was slowing down, so that's good. We like to see that. The ambulance is here. The ambulance is there? You're not what you have them there? No. Okay, so I'm going to let you go so you can talk to them, okay? Okay. Okay. All right. Good luck. Bye. When the cougar charged at them, Isaac hit it with his bike, which had initially scared us off. But as the two were catching their breath, the cougar reappeared and attacked Isaac, biting his face. Police arrived to Isaac's aid 13 minutes after his 911 call. An hour later, they found SJ's bike and body. The cougar was later found hiding in a tree and was shot and killed by state wildlife agents. Isaac and SJ did do the right thing by getting off their bikes and shouting at the cougar. This would have deterred any other cougar, but something was wrong with this particular one. It was underweight and measured only 100 pounds. A typical 3 year old male in the area would be 140 to 180 pounds. The cougar's body was examined at a veterinarian lab in Washington State University. Results came back that it was lean, but not actually underweight. There was nothing to explain the animal's behavior. SJ Brooks is the only fatality of a cougar attack in Washington since 1924, when a 13-year-old boy named Jimmy Fellhaber tried to outrun a cougar and was subsequently killed by it. Originally from Seattle, SJ had spent time as a student in Montreal, Canada and Boston. It was in Montreal that his love for cycling began. He had co-founded Friends on Bikes, which promotes diversity in cycling. The group wants to ensure that women, trans, and non-binary people of color can have a safe, supportive cycling community. SJ was described as a funny, kind, and inspiring person who will be dearly missed by everyone who knew him. If you ever encounter a wild animal, experts say that running in rapid movements can provoke its prey drive and trigger an attack. What you are actually meant to do is face the animal Try to appear as big as possible and slowly back away, while keeping your eyes on us. If it does attack, do your absolute best to fight back. On February 2nd, 2010, 22-year-old Umberto Delgado Jr., called 911 after his pickup truck crashed into a pond in Winter Garden, Florida. 911, emergency? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm on, I was on the 429, get off, uh, onto Plant Street, uh, I went off the road, I'm in a retention pond right now. You're in the retention pond? Yeah. Okay, what city are you in? I don't know if I'm at the ground, I don't know if I'm gonna sink or nothing right now, I don't see a truck sinking or anything, but... Alright, let me get you paramedics, don't hang up, okay? Alright. Our rescue, what's the address of the emergency? That's 35. Uh, not, I'm not sure, ma'am. Um, uh, I'm not at 429. On the 429, getting off Plant Street. 429 in Plant? Uh, yeah, getting off of Plant Street. What direction are you heading, hon? Well, I was getting off the plant. I was getting off the 429. Uh, yeah, I know. Are you, are you going southbound? 
Yeah. Are you in Oak? Are you? Are you in Ocoee or Winter Garden? Winter Garden. <laughs> okay. And what's going on there? Well, uh, I fell off the road. I went off the road right now. Um, I'm in the retention pond. Uh, I don't know if my Yeah. I'm, I'm like, I don't know if my truck's going to sink into the water or not. Are you off? I'm, I'm trying to get out right now. <laughs> Okay, hold on a second. You said East Tank Street and State Road 429? Yeah. Okay, which direction were you going? Divers found the truck six to eight feet deep at the bottom of the pond. By the time divers found him, he had already drowned. To this day, investigators still don't know what caused him to lose control of the vehicle. It's also not known whether alcohol played a role in the incident. On December 11, 2012, a mass shooting took place at the Clackamas Town Centre, a shopping centre located in Clackamas County, just outside of Portland, Oregon. 22-year-old Jacob Tyler Roberts entered a shopping mall wearing black clothing and a Jason mask and opened fire on anyone he saw. December 11, 2012, 15, 28, 42. Nine one one. What's the location of your emergency? Yes, yeah, we're at Macy's at Clackamas Town Center. We think we have a shooter in the store. Okay. Do you know if anybody's injured? We don't know. You know what? All we hear is shots and and people are screaming and running. Okay. We're getting, and are they upper level or lower level? Upper level. I don't know where the shots are coming from. Okay. Hold on. We're getting help started. Right. Now. Okay. We've got help on the way. Okay. Macy's. I know. We've got him on the way. Thank okay. you. Bye bye. Bye. Can you walk through? You have reached Clackamas County 911. Do not hang up. For help, after the tone, say help. Hello? 911, location of your emergency? Okay, I need to get yourself to a safe location. We have help on the way, okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Nine one one. What is the location of your emergency? Town center. There's a shooting. Okay. Town center. We need people. Where at? At the town center. We're at Macy's upstairs fragrance. Who was shot? I don't know. I'm I'm hiding underneath the uh, I'm hiding underneath the register. Okay. My partner is going to be dispatching help while we're talking. Whereabouts in the Macy's do you think the shooter is? Um, it's got to be upstairs around the around the food court. All the alarms are going off. Please, where are you? Please. Hold on just a moment. What? I'm sorry. I, sir? Sir? Brian! Did you actually see this or are you just hearing this? No, no, it just was a horrid, horrid, like 15, 20 gunshots right outside, right outside the, the entrance to the upstairs of Macy's. I don't okay, I'm going to disconnect with you. They're already dispatched around the way. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Nine one one. Clackamas Town Center, Fredericks of Hollywood, uh, fired in the mall. Okay, they'll be on their way. Thank you. Thank you. You have reached Clackamas County. Nine one one. Do I not hang up. For help, after the tone, say help. Help. Is this about the shooting at the town center? Yes. Did you see it? No, I'm in fire at Macy's. Okay. Hang on just a second for me, okay? I'm getting help started. Do you see what they look like? 
No, sorry, we're in the store, but it was You're inside outside. Macy's. It's, it's either inside or right outside. Still inside Macy's. Okay, we're getting people there as soon as we can. Get yourself to a safe spot. All right, thanks. people is he shot? I don't know right now. I'm in the store still. I can just barely see him out uh, there. Okay. Is there any description of him? Um, I can't see right now. And what kind of gun does he have? Handgun or rifle? Yes. It's a rifle. Bye. The shooting left three people dead, including Roberts, who shot and killed himself. The two innocent victims were identified as 54-year-old Cindy Ewell and 45-year-old Stephen Forsythe. Stephen left behind two children, and Cindy left behind a 23-year-old daughter and a 13-year-old stepson. It's unknown for sure why Robert shot up the mall. He had apparently planned to move to Hawaii, but it didn't work out for some reason. It seems like just another random act of violence. On December 28, 2019, in Concord, North Carolina, multiple 911 calls came in after a shooting took place at the Concord Mills Mall. It had all started after a fight broke out at the entrance of Dave and Buster's, which is an arcade, bar and restaurant. One of the callers described the shooter as a black man wearing a hoodie with red and white checkers. They said they heard at least 15 gunshots. Where's Kenny 911? Hello? Yes, 911. Oh, uh, hi, yes. Um, I live over in the Bexley, um, the Bexley Mill, uh, Concord. And it sounds like a bunch of shooting outside right now. Yep, we, uh, we, get, we got everybody on the way to it. Thank you very right, much. Thank you. Where's Kenny 911? 911, hello? We're just gonna share ourselves with luck. Hey, yes, sir. We've had a shooting at Concord Hills Mall. We have kids that have been shot outside. 
How, how many patients do you have? I have one I know that's been shot in the arm right now. Okay. It's right outside Dave and Buster's. We're yeah. right outside Dave and Buster's. Uh, all right, stay on the line with me, man. Stay on the line with me. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go cover his arm with, with a towel, sir. Yeah, all right. Stay, like, where are you at at the mall? Where are you at at the mall? Okay. Ma'am, where are you at at the mall? I'm at Dave and Buster's. I'm right at the entrance of Dave and Buster's from the parking lot. Alright, and is, is it just one person that's been shot? Yes, it's just one person that I see right now that's been hurt. Alright, he's been shot in the arm? There's another, yes, and there's another one outside that's been shot in the parking lot. Okay, all right, we, we've got him on the way to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, 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 thank you. Right. County, no one. Yeah, no. how you doing? I'm at uh, Concord Mills with David Buster, and, uh, We've got a lot of kids running around here. I don't know. Yes, uh, sir. Yes, sir. We've got we've, we've got everyone on the way. Okay, then. Thank you. Okay, then. Thank you. Hey, Kelly, okay, no one. one. Hi. Um, I'm at Concord Mills right now. It's I'm not sure if it's shooting or if it's fireworks that they're doing. All right. Yeah, we've got we've got yeah, okay. police, fire, and ambulance on the way. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Tragically, a 13-year-old by the name of Aviana Probst was shot and later pronounced dead. Two boys aged 15 and 16 were also shot, but they survived. At first, it was speculated that Aviana was involved in the fights at Dave & Buster's, but it was later learned that she had nothing to do with any of us. She was just an innocent bystander who had been struck by a stray bullet. On January 1st, 2020, an 18-year-old named Dante Black was arrested and charged with committing the shooting. Dante had gotten into a fight with an unidentified 16-year-old. When they were asked to leave, Dante walked out the exit while the 16-year-old left through Dave and Buster's, worried that Dante may be armed. When Dante saw the 16-year-old in the parking lot, he fired shots at him, but they missed and instead hit Aviana and the two other teens. A 15-year-old friend of Dante's was also arrested and charged with being involved in the shooting, but because he is underage, his identity and mugshot have not been released. Dante was charged with one count of first-degree murder and felony riot. As of February 2021, a trial has yet to commence. Aviana was in the 8th grade and attended Ace Academy Public Charter School and was set to graduate last year. She was described as kind and caring. Her funeral was packed with friends and family who celebrated her life and said their final goodbyes to the teenager. To make things even more tragic, a few hours prior to her death, Aviana's cousin, 31-year-old Darren Jordan, was shot and killed at 7.56pm, about 10 miles east of the Concord Mills Mall. He had been shot while waiting for a bus on Lincoln Street in Malvern Drive. On January 2, 2020, police announced that they had arrested 16-year-old Omarion Hudson and charged them with first-degree murder. The two shootings were not related, despite the victims being cousins. On June 1st, 2013, a 62-year-old woman named Eugenia Anderson called 911 after a man broke into her house in Orient, Ohio. The woman and her husband, 68-year-old Harry Butler, knew the home intruder. He was 41-year-old Michael Melrose. The couple had hired Melrose to install a porch for them. However, an argument occurred because of the cost of the porch. At around 9.55pm, 
Melrose broke into the house and tied up Harry while Anderson hid and called 911. Where's your emergency? Hello, 911. Oh my god, I'm dead! Oh my god! 911! Uh, well, I won't tell on you, I promise. This is 911, state your emergency. Hello? Where are you? Rebit. Oh, I can't. Your 911 will come back up. 911, where are you? Hello? I can't help you if I don't know where you're at, honey. Oh, my God. Where are you at? Oh, no, no. Where are you? Oh, please, don't. Please, don't. Okay. Oh, my God. I need as many units as I can get. Somebody's screaming, and somebody's screaming he's got a gun. Hey! Screaming help. Stop! I won't get on you, I promise. I promise. I'm so screwed down. It's not you. Try 3-8-6. Try 3 8 After the call was ended, Melrose shot the couple to death. When the 911 operator called back, Melrose answered the phone, and this is what he said. Oh, 
Hello. Hi, dispatcher Sellers, Pickwick County Sheriff's Office. I got a 911 call from the center. I'm just trying to make contact back and see if everything's okay. We're fine. And we were having a little argument. And okay. Yeah, that's everything. Well, whenever we get a hang up, we have to call back and, and see, you know, if anybody needed help and just couldn't get through. So um, I just need to log the information. Who am I speaking with? My name is Harry. Harry? Uh huh. Harry, what's your last name? Finch. Harry Finch. Okay, and I had you at 5386 Fairfield Road. That's correct. And phone number 614. That's also correct. Okay, and um, is there anybody else there with you? No, she, she took off down the road in her car. Okay, she left the residence? Yes, she did. Okay, what kind of car is she in? It's a, a Saab. Okay, a Saab, like a sedan? Yeah. Okay, hold on for me, Harry. Okay, Harry. Well, I've got a couple deputies out there. It's standard procedure to send somebody, so I need you to open the door and talk to them, okay? Okay. Are they here yet? 228. I believe they just pulled in. Okay. Okay? Thank you. When police arrived at the scene, Melrose shot himself and committed suicide. Butler was found tied up in the front room of the house. He was still alive, but died later on at a hospital. Anderson was found dead in the back bedroom with multiple gunshot wounds. Investigators discovered multiple firearms in the house. It's believed Butler collected them as a hobby. On June 8, 2014, a woman called 911 after she was sexually assaulted. The woman was staying with her friend at a house close to the Ohio State University campus. She awoke in the middle of the night to a man holding a gun to her head and demanding that she perform sexual acts on him. What the operator says in the call will absolutely shock you. 911, what is your emergency? Um, I am staying at a friend's house on 14th and Summit, okay. and um, a bo I just woke up to a boy sticking a penis in my face, telling me that I had to suck it or he was going to shoot me. What's the address that you're at? Um, I think 14th and Summit. I'm going to go look outside, but um, is there any way that you guys can locate where my phone is right now? No, we can't. That's why I need to know where you are. I mean, are you going to be standing I, I, outside? I, I, really don't feel I don't feel comfortable going outside to look where it is. I'm only doing what the address is. Okay, I would look for some mail, ma'am. Um. Or wake someone um, up. I, I did just wake my friend up and, and she doesn't know what it is. Um. Emily, you're living here next year. What is it? It's 14th and Summit. It's a brick building. Okay, um, they're not going to be able to find you like that. If you're going to say 14th and Summit, you're going to have to come outside. Uh, if, they, if they come to it, if they can, we can come outside. We can come outside. I just, I, 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 I'm feeling really, really, really scared right now. Please come. They're going to come out there, ma'am, but you're going to have to be outside so they can find you. I, that's what I said. That's what I said. That's what What's I your name? What? My name. And was this a male white, a male black? It's a male white. It was a small male white boy. He was wearing a white shirt, and I really, really, if they see any small male white boy with a white shirt, I want them to. to Immediately arrest them. I'm not going okay. to do it. Ma'am, you're going to have to quit crying so I can get the information from you. Which way did he leave? He left out the back door. Okay, and was he at the house when you got there? No, absolutely not. He okay. broke into the house. How did he break in? Do you, which, where, where did he come in at? I have no idea. I have no idea. I have no, I have no idea the back door. 
Well, they're not going to be able to find him on this information uh, that you've given. We'll send the officers over to talk to you. Ma'am, you've only gave me a male white with a white shirt. Oh, he's okay, but you understand how horrified I am. <laughs> I'm like a very, very, like a 20-year-old from my Arlington. I don't know what you deal with every day, but the, the kind of sympathy you have right now is zero. <laughs> They're, the police are on their way to talk to you, ma'am, but how many male whites are out there? I understand, but like... <laughs> I'm scared out of my mind right now. I'm sorry. I just like I don't know what this guy said to me, but I've never been so scared in my life. Okay, he didn't touch you, correct? No, he did. He did. That's right. Where did he I touch you at? Like he was touching my pants. He was and touching I your hand. No, my pants, and like trying to take my pants off. <laughs> And that's what I woke up to freaking out. And that's when I think he was pretending to have a gun. And I was like, let me see it. Because I, like, I had no idea. I woke up in the middle of my sleep. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm like completely horrified right now. <laughs> okay, is your friend there with you? Does she get a look at him? No, she didn't. She woke up in the middle of it, and I kept trying to say something, and he kept telling me to be quiet. I'm not kidding. I actually want to kill this kid. <laughs> I've never been so upset in my life. <laughs> okay, where's the person that is live that lives there? And she's right next to me. She doesn't live here, though. It's her friends that are in her sorority. Okay, and where are those people at? They're sleeping upstairs. Well, can you guys get them up so maybe they know who this person I is? I, 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 they don't know who he is. He left the house. Can the cop, are the cops here yet? No, they're not there. They're driving to you. <laughs> he doesn't come a little faster. I'm freaking out. I'm freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> I go to a really small school in Pennsylvania, like I don't want to I've never even experienced anything close to this. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Campus is not that big. They're driving to you. Okay. <laughs> okay, you need to go outside because the officer's there. <laughs> I'm wearing white green pants, okay, and I'm wearing a white shirt, okay. Can you tell them that? I guess I'll let them know. They're going to be in the car 40. Where? Um, I'm waiting for the girl, we're outside. I'm sorry? 14th and Indian all up are outside. Where are they? Okay, you said 14 and Summit, ma'am. 14th and Indianola. So now they're you're at 14th and Indianola. Mm -hmm. Well, now they're. Sorry, I don't know where my state's campus is. I'm really sorry. I don't know. It's really wrong. Mm -hmm. In Indianola. It's, it's literally half a block. It's half a block. I see uh, there's, uh, there's uh, there a car coming down from somewhere right now. I think I see, I think, I honestly think I see if you tell them to turn right on 13th and then turn right on Indianola, I'll be right there. <laughs> Ram is 
is the cop car right here. <laughs> you have the officer? Yeah, I think so, I think so. Okay. <laughs> Thankfully, 30-year-old Michael Callahan was arrested and charged with rape and burglary. It was announced on June 23, 2014, that the dispatcher would not be reprimanded for her appalling attitudes. In Casey, Texas, on June 24, 2016, two 911 calls were made by Taylor and Madison Sheets after their mother, Christy, threatened to shoot them. The 42-year-old niece of Alabama had asked her two dulcers and husband of 20 years, 45-year-old Jason, to go into the living room for a meeting. The marriage between Jason and Christy had become turbulent, so Jason told Christy was going to inform her dulcers of their pending divorce. However, Christy pulled out a gun. She threatened to shoot the two girls. This is when the 911 calls were made. In the calls, you can hear multiple voices yelling and Jason telling his wife not to shoot. After the calls ended, Christy then shot Madison and Taylor. Madison only suffered one gunshot wound and died in the house. Taylor Sheets, however, managed to escape and run out of the house. Christy chased after her and shot her a second time, while Jason ran down the street looking for help. Police arrived at the scene and witnessed Christy shoot Taylor a third time. They demanded she drop her weapon but she refused to listen and fired at the responding officers. They opened fire once on Christy and killed her. One of the family's neighbors saw the entire thing and called 911. Towards the end of the call, the caller tells his son in Spanish that he would never shoot him and he would never do that to him. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, yes, uh, we need an ambulance uh, right away. That two people believe, uh, believe they're shot. Okay, stay on the line. Okay, you think they got shot, you say? Yes, yes. Okay. All right, stay on the there, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a lady with a gun. There's a lady there's with a lady. gun? Where? Yes. It's coming out of the house right now. Two okay. People shot outside. Okay. People shot outside. Okay. Where is the lady with the gun? It's coming out of it's on the street right now. Is she still shooting? Uh, no, it's not shooting, but it's the gun in her hand. I ran to the back of my house. Okay, who do you know who the lady is? Uh, they're my neighbors. I don't... Okay, and the people that she shot, are, are, do you know them? Are, like, no, are ma'am. Her? Okay. Are, are, you with the, are you with the patients right now? No, because the lady okay. with the gun what came out. I had to run. Describe her for me. What is she wearing? What is she wearing? I'm sorry. Okay. Well, I have to run to the back. Okay, I understand. Uh, what is she? Me, can you describe her for me? What is she? White, black, Hispanic, or Asian? She's uh no, she's a uh, Caucasian. Okay. Go back there. Uh, okay. What is she wearing? 
She's wearing a dress. What color dress? Yeah, uh, let, me, let me try to pick her a window. Sorry. Okay, okay, no problem. Don't put yourself in danger, though. But do you remember what co what color her dress was? She's wearing a, a, a purple dress. Purple dress? Yes. Okay. She's wearing a purple dress. She, she's on the... Is it long, short? What is she? She... Where are the patients? They're, the, they're in the street. They're in the middle of the street. But okay. I was long, though. It's two people laying in the street? Two people, two ladies laying in the street. Two females? Okay. Yeah, two females. And there's a guy trying to help them. But the okay. lady is on, top, on the top of one of them with a gun on her hand. Okay, but the the, sub, the the suspect is on top of one of the females on the street? Yeah, she's just she's, she's on the street, just standing up. She's standing over at one of the patients with a gun? Yes, yes. Okay. And uh, it looks like both of them are alive. Both of the child person, the, okay. the two ladies, they're, they're both alive. But Okay. And, you know, she tried to shout again. She's trying to shoot again on the top of her, but okay. apparently she don't have no more. Apparently she don't have any more bullets. Okay, yeah, I, I do too, sir. Just stay on the line. And let me know what you see. But don't. Okay. I don't she's going. She's going inside. She's going inside the house now. Uh, okay. Hopefully, it's not getting any more bullets because she looks like she's going to look for more bullets. Okay. All right, stay on the line. And there's a. I don't know where the guy went, but apparently she's she's ye yelling at her. And okay. they're talking back Who and forth. The, the, describe the guy. The guy is, a, is a also, they're all uh, Caucasians. Okay. Okay, and so the okay. the two females and the male is Caucasian. Yes, all, all, all four of them. Okay. And is the male she, she is also? She, she's She's coming back again. She's coming back again. With a, like, apparently, she has bullets now on her. On her. Okay, stay, stay on the line. Oh, she shot her again. She shot her she again. She shot her again. Yes, from the back. She's trying to run. She shot. She shot another the female again. That was. Yes, that was laying down on the floor. Okay. She shot her from the back. Okay, stay on the line. She's shooting she, 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 again. They're running. Her, her. Down the street. Adrian, ¿dónde estás? No, bájate, Adrián. Porque es más arriba, más fácil que se vaya una bule. ¿Por qué te fuiste para allá? Vente okay. para acá. Sir, what do you yes, see? What is she doing now? Ella se quiere, lay down on the floor. Okay, sir. Lay down on the floor, Adrián. Yeah, make sure your family is, is secure. Don't 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 let yes. anyone see you looking out the window, okay? Can can anyone see you? Yes, sir. Her no, that's, that's her address. Okay. I can hear her. I, I don't see them anymore. But okay. there's the bullets. I can I can hear bullets. And she's she's laying down on the floor now. The female that was shooting is laying down? Yes. Did she shoot herself? I don't know. I don't know. I I just see her down on the floor now, but I don't I don't know what happened. Because I had to want to uh, take okay. my son to safety. Okay. Con qué estás hablando ya? Okay. Did she shoot herself? Apparently she did. You think she shot herself? Apparently she shot herself. Yes. Okay. Then is she I, don't, I don't see. I don't. She's moving. Yes. Okay. You know, it doesn't look like she's moving anymore. Okay. Okay, okay, sir, I'm so sorry you're saying this, okay. but just stay on the line. Okay. Okay, sir. Yes. Okay, what do you see now? Are the two are are the two females still laying in the street? Uh, I can't see them. Uh, I have to say, take my son to safety. Hold on a second, please. Okay, no problem. If you if you if you have to take your family to safety, then don't worry about going back are, to the window. Are they, are they, Quédate aquí, bien. quédate aquí. No, en el closet, aquí está bien. Ya está bien, ya, ya, ella ya se disparó la que estaba disparando. Ok.
Okay, pero con cuidado, Mecha, okay? Nosotros estamos bien. Okay, sir, do you happen to know the names of these people? Do you know your neighbors? Uh, no, I don't know their names or anything. Okay. Okay, preciosa. Oh, sorry, preciosa. Pero no te vayas para arriba nunca, okay? Cuando vayas así, algo así. I'm sorry. I had to call my son because I, he's I crying too. I'm, I'm so sorry you had to see that, sir. I'm, I'm so sorry you had to see that. They're on the way. Just let me know what you see. If you, if you see anything change, let me know. We have multiple deputies on the way, okay? Okay. Uh, she's laying down on, on the floor is still. She, is she still not moving? She's still not moving. Okay. Okay, uh, the deputies are arrived already. Okay, all right, and what's your address? Taylor was brought to hospital but was pronounced dead upon arrival. Prior to killing her own daughters, Christy had suffered from depression and had been drinking heavily. Police had responded to the address 13 times prior, three of which were because of suicide attempts. A few days before she was killed, Taylor got into a huge argument with her mother. Christy wanted to ground her and prevent her from getting married to her fiancé, who she was due to marry on June 27th, three days after she died. Jason believed it was inappropriate for Christy to ground her 22-year-old daughter and prevent her from seeing her fiancé. It's believed this argument was the last straw for her. Jason told investigators that he believed the killings were motivated by revenge. Instead of shooting Jason, which she had the chance to do, she decided to shoot the two most important people in his life and make him never forget that day for as long as he lived. To make all of this worse, the killings took place on Jason's 45th birthday. Christy was a huge advocate of the Second Amendment and had applied for a concealed carry permit but was denied one. The gun she used to kill her daughters was given to her by her grandfather, who had died in 2012. She loved her grandfather, and his death is what is believed to have started the downward spiral of her mental health. Jason has said that his faith in God is what saved him but wished God would have taken him and saved his daughters.